I'm back in plenary session, virtual edition. I'm joined by Mani Moyudin. This is an impromptu discussion of how I treat frontline multiple myeloma. Mani, it's great to see you again. Yeah, the pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. Assistant professor, University of Utah, Huntsman Cancer Center myeloma doctor. Everyone knows who you are on this channel. And we're back to talk about myeloma. Okay, it's called How I Treat Frontline Transplant Eligible Multiple Myeloma. And um, I had a chance to read this. A couple of people sent it to me. The visual abstract caught my eye. I'm going to put a picture of that on the screen. I'll put it up right now. And there's a lot to talk about. Okay. First, I want to say, you know, I really don't like your field. <laughs> I don't like myeloma. I don't like where it's going because you have so many randomized trials. You have so many uncontrolled studies, but just fundamental questions are not answered. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that this article is claiming that I think are much more ambiguous and really don't have great data for. So let's start it off. The article makes the case that the de facto first option for a transplant eligible newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patient under the age of 70, they say quadruplet. And specifically, they say DARA VTD. Um, thoughts? Quadruplet? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so when it comes to DARA VTD, we have data from a randomized trial, the Cassiopeia trial, which compared that to VTD. Mm -hmm. um, and then patients went on to get transplant, and then there was a second randomization in which, you know, patients either were observed or or had daratumumab as maintenance. Um, one can argue that those results are not necessarily um, extrapolate extrapolatable to the U.S., where we use mm -hmm. Belkid Revlimid dexamethasone for induction. Um, but I would argue that that's the quad trial that we have with the longest follow up where there is a progression-free survival benefit with the use of DVTD compared with VTD. Ultimately, patients in the VTD arm who got randomized to receive their tumor lab maintenance largely caught up, all right? So they, their uh, you know, outcomes ended up being fairly similar in terms of progression-free survival to those who got DERA VTD, the quad as induction, followed by observation as maintenance. So yeah, there's some long. What percent from... of people in that trial had transplant? So it was a transplant. So people, so people got transplant like mm -hmm. after the induction therapy. So transplant rates were very high because that it was a transplant eligible trial. So everybody right. got VTD or DERA VTD and then went on to get an auto transplant. Um, so that's the quad data that we have with the longest follow up. But the problem is that's with the thalidomide containing regimen, and we don't use that in the U.S. Right. For when it comes to the what we could do in the United States, we have the Griffin trial, which was a phase two trial, which is a comparison of DARA, Velcade, Revlimid, Dex versus Velcade, Revlimid, Dex. It's important to note that the primary endpoint of this trial was stringent, complete remission. Mm. So this trial is not powered for progression free survival, and it's not powered for MRD negativity, which is what we all like to talk about with this trial. Um, so yes, the trial met its primary endpoint. The stringent, complete remission rates were higher with DARA VRD compared with VRD. And then on longer follow-up, maybe, and again, the trial is not even powered for that, the progression free survival curves are just beginning to separate. But we have no idea about long-term outcomes such as overall survival. Neither is this particular trial powered uh, to answer those questions. And there are some confirmatory uh, trials that are pending right now um, that are comparing data VRD to VRD for both the transplant eligible population and the non-transplant eligible population. But you're absolutely right that when it comes to long-term outcomes, such as overall survival, in the setting of good post-protocol therapy, we don't know whether quads are better than triplets. So I think that's and, kind of where we're at right now with, with the field. And I think that's key. And uh, let me push on that a little bit more. I mean, when we're talking about PFS and myeloma, we are often talking about elevations and free life chains after treatment. And, you know, people don't always feel that. It's something that they find out when they come to the doctor's office. That's scored as a progression event. And the fundamental question, I think, with all, with all these myeloma drugs is you have so many drugs that are active, unlike some cancers where they don't have that many drugs that are even active, like pancreas. You have so many active drugs. The question is, the philosophical question is, how many do you use, in what sequence, in what order, to maximize health-related quality of life across the whole cancer journey, and longevity? Those are the two things we want to maximize. And to me, I guess the thing, the first place I come off the, uh, the road 
It's just I just don't think PFS in a frontline study is not even a useful endpoint. It's 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 completely useless endpoint. I mean, I want to know that if I take all these drugs and I move them all the way to the front and I lose potentially salvage options, I'm going to gain something for that in the long haul, either a sustained health related quality of life benefit over several lines of therapy or overall survival benefit. The trials are not even designed looking for that. They're looking for trivial differences in the time until a blood protein goes up. Uh, no so argument. I, I, no, I, I, so I completely agree with you yes. with what you're saying. And I, but the, the, I guess the sad part is, you know, philosophically, I think about this, that as our treatment options get better, one can argue that the bar should be higher, right? If you have more and more treatment options, the bar should be higher. like Not lower, improve. yes. But in, in a way, you can argue that if you get more and more treatment options and you settle for PFS, then in a, if any, and MRD negativity, in many ways, you're making the bar lower. Um, so, you know, I largely agree with what you're saying, but I think the, at least for newly diagnosed myeloma, there's very little interest in the field for keeping progress, for keeping overall survival as a primary endpoint. And it's largely driven by, um, by how long it's perceived that it'll take to show an OS uh, difference. Um, because for standard risk myeloma, where you're projected to have an overall survival exceeding, you know, a decade. I think there's very little appetite now to um, to have that as an endpoint, and it goes back philosophically to you know we're we're lowering our standards. Things have gotten so well that now, in order to improve things, we're effectively lowering our standards by setting different endpoints for but I yeah for go on diagnosed. Uh, but so I'm so I'm with you, but I think there's very little appetite to make overall survival an endpoint for the newly diagnosed field and. Um, I mean, I see arguments on both ends. I see your argument, and I hear the argument where it's going to take too long, and you know, innovation will be will be stifled. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I, I, you know, it's, it's very tough. And I can really agree with you that if you settle for MRD or PFS as the first as a primary endpoint, you can just add more and more drugs, and you're going to get a successful of result. Of course, it's and a self fulfilling prophecy. It is, but, a but you know, I, I guess I, 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 I agree with you. There's no appetite. That's where we totally agree. This is the world we're living in. But here's why there's no appetite: because 95 percent of the doctors in myeloma are on the payroll of pharma. They're taking hand over fist money from pharma and moving all the drugs up. It's not what's best for patients. It's best for pharma because they guarantee that everybody with a myeloma diagnosis is going to get their drug before they die because they know that if you sequenced all the drugs and my drug is fourth in line, the fraction of people who get the fourth in line therapy is lower. Now, they, they want to tell stories that contradict each other. One, they say, if you don't give all your drugs up front, some people will never get it. They say that, right? That some people will That's never fair. get it. But if that were true, then you should see an OS benefit. You know, that giving it up front versus giving it delayed, it will be easy to show an OS benefit if it is the case that so many people don't get it that you could never recover the OS. If that were the case, you should see the OS benefit. The other paradox they always say is it'll take too long to show the OS benefit. But what that means is your drugs are so marginal, they can't dramatically increase overall survival. And as much as we like to say, you know, myeloma is a disease where outcomes are so good. It's not like uh, primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. They have like a 98%, you know, five-year right. survival rate. And even they have had randomized trials that they have had overall mortality benefits like Jupiter. You know, so that that's the cardiology world. They're talking the 90%. They're finding, you know, OS benefits. We're talking about median survival. You know, we can debate different benchmarks, but 7 okay. to 11 years, something in that ballpark. Um, and we're saying we can't. And, and then the other fallacy, you don't have to wait for the median to be reached to see the OS benefit. Uh, agreed. Vel Velcade, melphalan, prednisone, versus melphalan, prednisone, OS benefit was 16 months from enrollment. Totally. Okay. I, I, I agree largely with what you're saying. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think that this attrition point that, yes. that you brought up is, uh, so there's, there are many caveats to that. And I think that one of the unfortunate things, and we've sort of shown this for recent studies with daratumumab, is that, you know, when you study daratumumab in the newly diagnosed setting, it's not that you lost people. To, I mean, people made it to the second line of treatment, but mm -hmm. you didn't give them teratumumab, right? So that's the separate issue, right? They're, they're, exactly. They're, so they weren't doing, lost. Yeah, yeah they're doing they're, bad post-protocol therapy, and then you show that there's an overall survival advantage, but you're not giving people 
an effective drug that is known to be effective at the time you're running the trial at progression. It's totally inappropriate. So, I mean, they're giving all the drugs up front versus running the trial in a resource limited setting where you don't get any of the drugs on progression. And then they say PFS is better. Of course, that's the self-fulfilling prophecy. But then they say OS is better too. And you're left to believe that that PFS benefit translated an OS benefit. But the reality is that one arm got just negligent care post protocol. Uh, actually, both arms did, but at least one arm had access to the drug. The other arm never got access to the drug. Right. And you know, PFS is widely accepted as a regulatory endpoint for myeloma. But you and I have a paper, hopefully it'll mm -hmm. come out in the next few months where yeah. we sort of, uh, you know, we talk about the, we, or we, we formally analyze the surrogacy of PFS for OS and our findings are very sobering, sobering. and surprising. Yeah. Uh, I won't, I won't spoil too much about it, but I, I think that's also, yeah. that's, a, that's also a, a notion that we sort of have, which, which kind of needs to be challenged. And there are multiple high profile examples where PFS is not correlated to OS. And this should be very sobering, especially as now we're trying to establish surrogacy of yet another endpoint. MRE and what happened for with, PFS. Uh, yes, what right. happened with venetoclax? Exactly. So venetoclax, you know, was studied for relapsed refractory myeloma, venetoclax bortezomib dex versus bortezomib dex. And even though the PFS was better with venetoclax bortezomib dex, the OS was worse. And, and what happened with the Pembro? Example. What happened with Pembro? So in Pembro, the PFS and OS both were, so there Dismissed. wasn't a discordance. Right. So in that, the overall survival was worse, but there wasn't <laughs> a, a PFS benefit either. But, you know, yes. melflufen is an example where melflufen yes. uh, dexamethasone was compared to pomalidomide dexamethasone. Again, better PFS in mm -hmm. the melflufen dexamethasone arm, but service. also more deaths. Um, so there have several high profile examples and make us reconsider. Um, our, but you know, in our Pembro's question, example, there wasn't an PFS decrement to Pembro. That's correct. Yeah, so it was, correct. A, it was an increased death signal in the absence of a decrement. But your point, okay, so correct. the point we want to make here is clearly um, PFS, drugs that increase PFS, provide no guarantee whatsoever that you will increase OS. And so this mantra that people say, I mean, I think there is a core contradiction, which is, it, you know, it would take too long to improve OS, ergo, we have to rely on PFS. But relying on PFS doesn't mean you're making people live longer. You know, you just don't know that to be true. Right. And I guess the only other caveat that I would sort of bring up for your discussion is mm -hmm. when we talk about all of these points, you know, we're, we're looking at myeloma as more of a chronic disease. And I think just, I'm just sort of, you know, giving the other perspective is, Perhaps we can cure a greater fraction. And again, OS would show that, right? But perhaps of course. by, you know, adding more therapies and, you know, doing these highly intensive approaches up front, you can cure a greater fraction. And time will tell, right? So time will tell, well, long term yes. follow up will tell whether quads plus auto transplant like cures a more substantial amount. Oh, of gosh, patient. that cure word. So, uh huh. But to I be know, a cure, so you have to stop treating them. If you give them drugs for the rest of their life, that's not a cure. That's a chronic I, ailment. Yeah, that's correct. a function. And, yes. And I would hope that the field is changing. So there's some early phase data now where, you know, you, you do quads and then you do a transplant and then you do a few more quad cycles and you can stop therapy and just watch, oh, you know, okay. check MRD. <laughs> so that has not been, so that uh -huh, needs to yeah. be formally studied in randomized yes. trials. And I think, and, and if that is the kind of future we're going to, then, then you can say there's probably some justification to give more intense treatments and then just watch. But yes, with the current paradigm where you give expensive treatments year after year after year after year, um, it makes sense to save you know some of your treatments for later and right. uh, it would cost less and, and probably lead to better quality of life. I want to run through my points, but first I want to ask you this question. Let's say philosophically we lived in a world where the FDA um, you know, actually was competent and then they demanded that I'm not going to approve any multiple myeloma drug until you show me it improves overall survival in a backdrop of proper US-based standard of care. Okay, that's my premise. You have to show me OS. Now, let's say you're the manufacturer. You make a new drug. Your new drug targets some new antigen on the surface. It's a monoclonal antibody. Okay. Um, you're living in my world now. You're not living in MRD world or PFS world. You're the company. Now, what would be, uh, uh, this is a pop question, but what do you think would be the most logical first trial? You need to get your drug on the market real quick. What are you going to run to show me a quick OS that I give you the drug, I give you the market share? What are you going to run? Totally. So you would study a heavily relapsed refractory population. So you would define it as, I guess you could define it as like penta refractory, right? Five so or refractory more, I like that, yeah. Yeah, so refractory two IMIDs or two PIs and a CD38 monoclonal yeah. antibody. Yeah. And then you would compare it against um, against 
you know, an investigator's choice of therapy. Yeah. And you could allow alkylators, you could allow reuse of previously um, used drugs. You could allow Selenexer. I mean, you could allow Belantamab. Um, <laughs> that's like a great, uh, I mean, yeah, you, you should allow- It's a lot of heterogeneity, but it's yeah. real world, right? In real world, there's a lot of heterogeneity in how myeloma is treated. Yes. And then you would power this for OS and yes. the natural history of this pentary yes. refractory disease yes. is that the survival is less than a year. Yes. Um, I mean, maybe CAR-T will change yes. that, you know, no, time will but... tell. But uh, so that's what I would do. And that's, okay. uh, but that's not what's done, but that's- No, no, no. Okay. Do. Okay. Now, so we're talking yes. about this perfect. Okay. So I love that. So that's what I would do too. I would take penta refractory and if CAR-T makes a role, I'd say you have to re, you know, progress on CAR-T or BCMA or, exactly. you know, teclistimab or whatever the hell, all these things you, okay. This is my, this is the new world. Okay. First we do this trial. Investigator choice, unfettered choice, US based. Maybe you could even do plus or minus your drug. You know, for all I care, you do plus or minus your drug. You do plus placebo or plus your drug. You know, if you mm -hmm. think you can handle the drug drug interactions or you go up against it all because you think you're totally novel. You could you should be able to beat Palm for the third time or rev, you know, you should be able to win. Okay. Now let's say you get the OS gain. 16 month versus 9 month. You get the okay. OS gain. Mm -hmm. Good you got the market. You got the market share. So the first point I want to make is the industry would say that my standard would slow innovation. I think that's technically incorrect because the time to this result is actually faster than if you use a response rate and duration of response endpoint where you have to both measure the response rate and then among the responders, and they don't all respond in the first month, they respond throughout the enrollment of the study, you have to follow them to get some sense of the median duration of response. So it actually can take quite longer. And, you know, we published that paper, Emerson Chen and I, Gem mm -hmm. Internal Medicine, ma mapping that. Okay. You get your drug. Now you're the drug company. You're still in my world. You can, you, you obviously, you're not satisfied. You want a bigger market share. That's your goal. What's the net? Now, let's say you want to move up to second line. Okay. Um, from fifth line to second line. Um, but you have to have an OS benefit. How would you design your trial as, so you get the OS benefit as quickly as possible in the second line setting? So that's a great question. So it's going to be tough. So it's going to take much longer period of time now compared to pentary refractory disease. I think it's important for us to understand the, the natural history of myeloma. So yes, pentary refractory, you may reasonably get results within a year. But at first relapse, you know, you're talking a median survival now of and it depends what study you look at and then the things are changing, but you're looking at like six, seven years now. So right? now so let's say you, you want to speed it up. How can you speed it up? There's well, a tool you can, in your toolbox. Yeah. I mean, you can, one of the ways that is employed by pharma to, to, to speed things up is to run it in a country where they're not going to get good post yes, but, therapy. Okay, you're right. So that's um, the way they do it. But let's say you want to do it an ethical way. So you to, could, do it the, yes, to do it you the could, ethical way, you would compare against a contemporary regimen that we use at first relapse. So at the okay. minimum, it has to be triplet. And at the minimum, um, if, you know, patients haven't gotten, if they're not refractory to the CD38 monoclonal antibody, it should have a CD38 monoclonal antibody in there. And you can decide whatever triplet backbone you want to do, right? So if you want to do data carfils in their decks or data pond decks or, um, you know, I'll give you another index. option, another and, option. Yeah. You don't have to go in all comers. Oh, right. So I guess one, I mean, I guess if you're leading me this way, you could like enrich it specifically for patients with certain high risk features. So patients, let's say patients who relapse early, right? So relapse within 24 months of autologous transplant, right? So that is something you know that biologically these patients are on average likely to do worse. So you could enrich it for high risk. And that's um, what early. I think the, that's what they would do. I think that's what the yeah. company would do. They would enrich for high risk because they don't want to wait six years. They would enrich for high risk. Let's say... Let's say, um, let's say they get the OS benefit, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Okay, then they'll want to march it up all the way to the front. And I think they will continue to enrich for high-risk people. So how, already, I think in my strategy, we're not delaying the time to innovation. I think we're actually speeding it, I think. And I think we're targeting the drugs in the subgroups that are truly having unmet need. Okay, but let's say hypothetically, it was a negative study in the second line setting. It was negative there. Um, it didn't improve OS in the high risk population. Would and the this therapy was given at progression later, right? Correct, new correct, therapy. right. It had to be because it already yeah. had the penta refractory. It was given in the penta refractory in the control arm after correct. five things. Okay, and it didn't have the OS benefit even in the second line setting. Mm -hmm. Then I think 
we would the company would have almost no appetite to pursue a broad indication. Not only would it take long, they know the effect size is likely to be very low. If anything, if it didn't work in the high risk group, it ain't going to work in all comers. I think Correct. that's what they'll think. And we'll learn something about myeloma biology fundamentally, which is that even in this high risk group, it's okay to withhold the drug and give it later, and you can still get the same OS benefit. You know. Correct. Yeah, so, I mean that's a it's an ideal world, but that would lead to a lot more like cost conscious care and better use of our resources uh, and better yes. strategic design of of our trials, right? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, our current landscape is you know you compete against inferior treatments, and then you don't know which of your treatments is is better, right? Yes. So like <laughs> that same blood journal, that, that paper that you're quoting. So there was yes. also a paper for relapsed refractory myeloma. Oh God! I and like if yet. you if you look at that, basically it's like you know, every single permutation of three drugs is like is like listed there in like different columns, uh, depending on whether you're refractory to do lenalidomide or dare to map. And and because there's so many permutations, you don't know which one is better. And the reason there are so many permutations is because they're all comparisons of three versus two. And we yes. don't know we don't know which three drug regimen is better. And and I know that cooperative groups have tried to fund this, but you know, it's tough to get anything if, done without pharma. And pharma is not strategically okay. Here's my claim. To do such studies. The world I painted for you, if if you banned pharma companies paying investigators and you created more firewalls between pharma money and investigator slush funds, and you had some reg regulation around whether or not FDA reviewers could immediately go work for GlaxoSmithKline, we would live in my world. I mean, I think I that I mean that's my view is that the reason we tolerate the bullshit of my which I well, I'm going to go through these five points, but I think the the difference between the the scenario we I painted for you are you painted with me of like how you would pursue it if OS was the bar and what we have now and let's talk about what we have now. Here's how I would pursue it in the current world. One, I would do a last ditch study, single arm, get a response rate of 18%. I got authorization, right? 15% you know, maybe maybe we can dance, you know, 15%, we could dance, I'd dance with Rick, you know, maybe he'll give me the authorization, 15% response rate, and um, uh, and maybe I'll pair my drug with Dex, so I get a little boost from my buddy, okay, a little bit of high-dose Dex on board, too, okay, that's how I get the first authorization, then I would have all these drug dinners, all these things, I get all my friends in myeloma to do, um, against historical control in some data set, you know, my mm -hmm. drug is better, you know, I'd pepper the literature with just bullshit, 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 I'd Grease, I'd grease all these palms with some cash. I'd still be doing handsomely because, you know, I'm only paying them out, you know, less than 1% of my earnings, uh, mm -hmm. like to grease all these palms. Then I'll skip the second line, you know, screw that. Like, why do I, why don't I waste my time with some piddly market share? I'll go straight to the front line. I'll do my new drug plus VRD, primary endpoint, um, stringent CR. Uh, and uh, and then I'll concoct some bullshit meta-analysis to tell the FDA why stringent CR predicts PFS. Ergo, you should give me the, you know, it's a, it's a suitable surrogate for regulatory approval. And I guess the point I want to make here is that the current system is so bad that the myeloma patients are literally getting tons of drug products, have no clue if it's the optimal sequence. We're so far away from good science that it scares me. You don't have to comment. Yeah, to comment? I okay. largely agree with you. And as... You know, as an insider, um, you know, you you have to work with what you have, and uh -huh. um, and uh -huh. it's, it's it's very tough. And I I really do struggle with this. And I think this current landscape just like, you're like a soldier is, going into an unjust war. You have to tell yourself a story to go to battle. <laughs> yeah, I that's a very good analogy, but it's something I really do struggle with. Uh, and I think that you know, yeah. philosophically, I'm a minority in this yeah. in, in the field, and. Um, you're a conscientious yeah. objector. Your country <laughs> invaded another country. Your 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 person is saying go to war and slaughter those people. You believe it's an unjust war, and yet you're still sent into battlefield. And you think to yourself, I wish I lived in a perfect world, but my dictator is a tyrant. And okay, anyway, uh, here <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. I'll come back to that. Here are the points. Number one, I looked at their figure, and I think I showed the figure earlier in this video. So I'll just talk. One, um, you know. I, I think for me, I'm not persuaded quads is the answer. I think even after all these trials result and other people are persuaded, I won't be persuaded for the reasons we've discussed, but stem cell transplant. Now, I think the thing that people don't say enough is that there is not a single study in the modern world, and Hovon 95 ain't that study, in the modern world with modern drugs where there is a survival benefit to stem cell transplant in CR1. I think it's just there's just no data. That, like you cannot tell a patient in good conscience that you will live longer by getting stem cell transplant in CR1. 
there's some caveats to that. Okay. So, Good. As, so, um, <clears throat> so I guess the most relevant and recent example is you know IFM 2009. Yes. Where half the so patients all everybody got VRD, everybody got collected, and half the patients were randomized to get a stem cell transplant. And then half of them got some additional cycles of consolidation with VRD, and then everybody went on to land maintenance. So PFS was better with the transplant approach. OS was similar. Seventy-eight percent of patients in the control group eventually. who didn't receive a transplant mm-hmm. eventually did go on to get a transplant. So you are right that for a patient who is collected with stem cells, so and that's a big caveat because often you know patients are not referred to a transplant center and don't get collected, and then it's going to be very hard to collect them later after they've been on Revenant for years. Mm-hmm. But yes, hypothetically, if somebody has underwent stem cell collection and they're not going to get lost to follow up or, or et cetera, or whatever, you know, you can, they're going to follow closely like those young fit clinical trial patients in the IFM 2009 trial did. Then you can argue, yes, there is not an OS benefit for, um, for, but let me push you. Okay. I, 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 yes, I've, I mean, this is a brilliant point you're making, which is it's not a, it's not a trial of transplant versus no transplant. It's a trial of transplant now versus delayed transplant in a sizable majority. Now let's say, that one of the reasons, let's be honest, that people are still on the transplant bandwagon, what's the bias? Your hospital is pulling down a quarter of a mil in cash every time you do one. And every hospital is pulling down tons of cash and transplant centers make tons of cash. So even the few myeloma doctors who five or 10 years ago were like, maybe we don't need to do transplant, their bosses put the thumb on them and said, you need to shut the up about that transplant because we're making tons of cash. You're going to refer all your patients to transplant. I don't want to see you publishing any more papers being critical of transplant. Okay, they've all gone silent. They've gone totally cold because transplant makes a lot of money. Now let's say you live in my world, a world where investigators are committed first and foremost to the truth. All right, you run IFM 2009. It's a negative study for OS, but somebody says, look, it just shows that you know we can't do away with transplant in CR1. We'll have to have a sizable chunk in CR2 get transplant. I think the next follow-up study you might run is a randomized controlled trial, maybe even three arms or four arms, something even more complex so we get some more data. One, transplant in CR1 in the era of the newer drugs. Two, transplant, delayed transplant CR2. Three, transplant CR3. And then four, no transplant at all. You know, I guess what I'm suggesting is this trial proves that transplant in CR1 has not yet earned an OS benefit of a trans- delayed transplant. But what I don't know is that delayed transplant is necessary, you know? And to know that, I would need yet another arm where we do something less than that or omit more transplant and see. And this is the same with like Bernie Fisher. You know, he did radical Halstead versus mastectomy and then mastectomy versus lumpectomy. He did a second study to further erode what we were doing. Um, this study that I propose will never, I mean, you think it's unlikely to be done. Because I know, because the, the boss's thumb is on him and said, you need to keep that transplant mill going, and we need those patients. Okay? That's a cynical right. view. The temper study, temper the, it. Mm-hmm. The studies that we will get, and yes. I think that they still are a step forward, are that for patients, and it doesn't address any of what, anything of what you're saying directly, but we have two randomized trials that for patients who have achieved a really deep response, who are yes. MRD negative with induction alone, uh, they are omitting transplant for those studies. And I mean, or there's a randomization where half yeah, the patients get transplant, transplant and half omitted. of them get further like consolidation therapy. So that is a step forward. And and, oh, and perhaps the sizable amount of patients will be spared the toxicity of transplant if these studies in the future, you know, show um, what they're intended to show. And what's the primary but, endpoint of that study? PFS. It is still PFS. I'd have See, to and that's, sure, but it's I think it's, it's PFS, PFS too. Though. But that's also yeah. stupid. That's so fucking stu- that's so stupid because the goal is you omit it and you you don't care about when the M protein goes up. You want to know, can you do away with it and they live as long and have preserved quality of life? It, the primary endpoint should be twofold. One, uh, non-inferior OS. So that's a long endpoint and it'll have a futility rule that will be very hard to breach. So that'll let the trial run for a long time. Or two, superiority health-related quality of life longitudinally. And you'd have to keep collecting it later so that it's not a transient difference that it actually can be ameliorated later. Because one can imagine drugs that improve PFS1 have a early lead on health-related quality of life, but then your subsequent PFS has come fast and furious and they start to degrade. So, I mean, I think, I mean, that's just the way yeah, I Yeah, I think even PFS2 would be a good endpoint for that would be a better fine. trials. And or, you could yeah. argue that it would yeah. take less time and uh, it would account for what therapy is given. And I think it's it's used less often than it should be. And it would, it would have been a great trial for many of the, the, it would have been a great endpoint for many of the trials looking back. 
Okay, next thing I say, we could be, I mean, I, you know, I have my views on it. Okay, next, uh, the quadruplets we talked about. I have tech, I have tweeted, I'll stand by this, that no RCT in my mind shows quadruplets better than sequential triplets with proper access to post protocol care. So, Dara VTD versus VTD. Uh, I want to see an OS and I want to see that those VTD people got proper care. But also, I think it's irrelevant because if you, can be giving Dara a second line. Why are you wedded to Thal? But okay, anyway, um, you know, it's like it's like a it's like a hodgepodge of like, are we in a country with resources or not? Or we in which country are we in? Okay, um, next, tandem. This actually recommends tandem in high risk. Now, tandem transplant has a PFS benefit, as you know, in the New Lancet paper, but it don't have no OS benefit, p value 0.35, and that's an adjusted p value. Who should be get? I mean, I disagree. Tandem is should be off the table. Tandem is so toxic. You have to prove. I mean, what are we talking about tandem? Yeah. So I think the most robust data that we have for tandem transplant comes, I mean, it's against tandem transplant actually, comes from stamina trial, which, you know, people got VRD and there were three randomizations, one randomization to, um, so people got VRD and a transplant and then three randomizations. One arm gets, goes straight to revlimid maintenance. Another arm gets VRD consolidation and another arm gets like a tandem transplant. Um, and, uh, the PFS was very similar between all three approaches. So, you know, in, so overall intensive approaches, you know, such as a, you're doing another transplant did not benefit patients with multiple myeloma. So by and large, a tandem should not be a uh, part of our armamentorium. And now you can argue that in some of these trials, if you look back and you isolate the high risk patients and those that actually made it to a second transplant. So you're doing a per protocol analysis and not an intent to treat analysis. Right. And you're selecting right. for people who biologically right. were, you know, made it to the second transplant. Right. Yes, those patients did better, but that is a very flawed analysis because you're totally flawed. Looking at you're looking at a subset okay. for patients, you know, your trial was not powered for that. And you're not even doing an intent to treat analysis. You're doing a per protocol analysis for people who actually biologically made it to a second transplant. So it is it is very flawed data. And I personally, even for high risk, and then again, that's in the setting of like, you're comparing to like land maintenance. You're not comparing to what is done in the real world. And we can argue about it is that you don't go straight to land maintenance either for those high risk patients, right? No. So there really is no data that even for high risk myeloma, right. if you're doing a single auto and you're doing something more than Revlimid afterwards, all right? Like that, it's that doing a tandem is any any better, and I think it's it definitely is a very toxic procedure. Um, so yeah, people might have their opinions about it based on interpretation of their data, but there's really no strong data to guide um, tandem transplants in today's day and age, especially with VRD based inductions. You can argue that from some of the Europe data, when you're using VTD or other approaches, tandem may have a role, but if you're using VRD as induction. There's some good data from the U.S. that a tandem transplant is not beneficial. I say that uh, blew me away to see that on the thing. Okay, the next thing I say is I saw um, VRD maintenance was proposed uh, after the tandem transplant. I was like, come on, you're just just making things up. There's no, I mean, you, you what are we even talking about? VRD maintenance. Mont, any thoughts? I mean, I just put that in the making shit up bucket. I mean, yes, there are some trials that have two extra consolidation cycles after, you know, initial induction therapy or even after transplant, I yeah. think, but nothing that's maintenance. So this is, again, one of the examples where the field of myeloma largely adopts something uh, based on weak data, but it's adopted so rigorously that yeah. um, that it's, like, widely approached. It was like widely, like, adopted. Um, I can... Like, so this is based on a cumulative synthesis of fairly weak data, and it stems from a desire to delay progressions in patients with really high-risk myeloma, where you know that if you go straight to Revlimid maintenance, you know, you, 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 there's a high likelihood they'll progress quickly. You don't necessarily know, based on high-quality randomized data, yes. that doing more would be better. I guess the closest thing that comes to randomized high-quality data is the four, is a Forte trial, mm -hmm. where... Um, so, you know, there were three induction arms. Um, one arm was carfilzomib cytox index, and then two, two mm -hmm. other arms were carfilzomib revlim index. Mm -hmm. um, so the arm that sort of, you know, did have the best PFS was carfilzomib revlim index followed by auto. Mm -hmm. And then there was a second randomization, which various maintenance mm -hmm. strategies mm -hmm. were assessed, carfilzomib and revlim versus revlim alone. Mm -hmm. And the carfilzomib and revlim arm had a better progression-free survival. And this benefit was also seen in the subgroup of patients with high risk disease, mm -hmm. where they had a better PFS 
again, and uh, compared to just rev limit maintenance, you could argue, and I completely agree that to change maintenance therapies, yes. Yes. like you have to show an OS benefit. Yes. Like if for yes. patients who are already I in would. a remission, yeah. Yeah. who are not that symptomatic from their disease, yeah. the onus for additional therapies to show that it changes the OS. And we don't know that yet. Mm-hmm. But the Forte trial is the closest thing that we have to randomize data that shows that, you know, K, K plus R was better than R. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, it's a cumulative synthesis and interpretation of older, weaker data, and then some single center studies like the Emory experience where they gave VRD to yeah, people with high risk disease mm-hmm. after as maintenance and you know, compared to historical controls, their patients did well. So but I will nice. say that this is widely adopted uh-huh. and I am guilty of this too. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. go on the record that mm-hmm. I have this conversation with my pain, patients if they have high risk and I tell them, you know, I don't know whether it's necessarily better, but this is what we do. And these are the trials that we have. And um, so hey, I, it's I hard to, and, I don't blame, yeah. I don't blame you for, so, I mean, um, uh, yeah. we are all prisoners of, of the war, you know, we're all, we're all soldiers playing our part. Okay. But I do think yeah. that the goal would be, you'd have to do an, first of all, it had to be adequately powered at that randomization, uh, for OS, not adequately powered for people, for OS. And I don't know if it will be. The second question will be, you have to show the OS benefit. And the third question will be post protocol care in the control arm has to be decent. And it also has an uphill battle. And then the fourth question is K versus R, uh, K versus V. I think maybe it'd be nice to see it for the thing they yeah. actually recommend. So, you know, the only yes. one last thing I have is like, yes. you know, one of the, one of the abstracts that's going to be presented at ASCO is, Basically, it's called the ATLAS trial. Mm. And in that, patients with myeloma, um, after auto, there may, two, two maintenance strategies are being compared with an endpoint of PFS. One is Revlimid, and the other is KRD, Carfilzin of Revlimid Dex. So I'm, I'm, I'm not excited about this trial because, like, who cares if there's a PFS benefit if, like, you know, you're studying it for maintenance. Like, the onus for additional therapy at maintenance has to be that you change the course of you the know, disease. I'll tell you one more thing. Live longer. They do so many maintenance trials with PFS as the primary endpoint that by chance alone, OS will be positive and it won't be real because what you're doing is you're just got a bunch of bullshit seeding studies. They don't answer the question. They have to be powered for OS and that should be the primary endpoint of the study for it to be really sort of have some um, ability to hang your hat on it. Uh, and even better, it should be multiple showing the OS signal. But PFS, it's it, there's guaranteed to be one of these will be positive by OS. I mean, just by imbalance because it's you know not going to be perfect. Okay, um, last point, and then we'll, I'll give you some of what well, I got. Like uh, I don't know, I hit, I hit you up at the last minute for this unprovoked conversation, uh, and I'll give you some thoughts on why I really hate. I mean, I think myeloma is just going in the gutter. Um, okay, the free light chain thing. This person writes. You know, there's a question of slightly delaying the initiation in an asymptomatic patient, those with free light chain ratios over 100 only. Um, this is a particular interest in the current context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me say clearly, if somebody's free light chain ratio is 120, there's no, nobody has a gun to your head that says you have to treat that patient. You could easily observe that patient. And we know there's a fraction of those people, they ain't going to progress anytime soon. And they'll get a nice treatment-free holiday. And there's nobody on this planet who's ever proven that such a patient benefits from routine upfront treatment. But they say blah, blah, blah. We did a study where we found that the slim crab subpopulation, when they're treated, they have comparable response rates, MRD negative rates, and PFS between the crab and the slim crab. And so they say, except for people on an, who is waiting to start therapy on an emergent basis, getting dental or cardiovascular assessments, quote, nowadays, there is no argument to further delay the start of therapy. And so it bothers me in so many ways. One, Merely showing that they have the same response does not prove that you ought to treat them. To prove you ought to treat them, you have to show that they benefit by being treated, which you have never done because that would require you to randomize them to treatment or no treatment. You've never even done that. You just changed a definition of a disease to make it include less severe disease. You never did any randomized studies. You're just making shit up so you could treat more people. You justify it because you say when they progress, who wants to progress with a broken femur? But the truth is a lot of people progress with just a little bit of anemia or a little bit, you know, rising uh, uh, plasma cell burden in the marrow uh, or, 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 or something that's of lesser severity. Um, uh, they don't always present with a broken femur. In fact, I think that's an atypical presentation of myeloma. Um, so, okay, this is something that treating smoldering, treat, I mean, d- d- there's just no, there's no study that will ever answer this question. The whole field has abdicated scientific responsibility. Right. And I, I get sad <laughs> because I think yeah, that if sad. you look at CLL, like they, they have a trial now, there's a SWOG trial that's yeah. studying earlier intervention versus delayed intervention 
with an endpoint of OS. And people with CLL live a long time too. So I get sad when I think about that, you know, CLL can do it for weekend. And the data for smoldering myeloma is very controversial. And the sad part is that there are many people, I think a substantial amount of myeloma doctors who don't agree with you and me about our views on PFS, et cetera. They don't treat smoldering myeloma. Like they are what do you and I have to say about smoldering myeloma? But you know, the, the the ones in positions of power who designed the trials are not going to agree to a control arm of observation for future smoldering randomized trials. So we're left with this, you know, we can undertreat patients with aggressive myeloma with poor control arms, but for smoldering myeloma, you just have to you have to treat the control arm is made in, in randomized trials. So I completely agree with you. Um and I think even the one trial that we do have, I mean, we have, we have, you know, two randomized trials, but the one more recent one by, um, which was the ECOG trial, like we still don't know, like, yes, so lenalidomide delayed progression events, but those progression events are, you know, we don't know how many fractures were prevented. We don't know how many people were prevented from going, going on dialysis. Like if you image people every two to three months and you find a bone lesion and yes, Revlimid prevented that asymptomatic bone lesion from yes. developing, yes. is that worth subjecting everybody to Revlimid for? The costs of treatment, even generic Revlimid is still very expensive. The risk for secondary cancers, uh, the toxicity. So it's it's tough. And I, and I you know, there's some very smart people with very good intentions who, and, and they may be right that, you know, maybe preventing is gonna lead to, to cure. But I think for other cancers, the road from prevention to cure is is very problematic. And for many other cancers, earlier detection has not led to, right. you know, an increased cure fraction. So we don't know if myeloma is going to be any different. It might be, and it's worth studying. But I think if you look at the history of screening and the history of earlier, earlier detection, earlier intervention, there are a lot of sobering findings. And I'm very, I'm very hesitant and I'm, I'm pretty scared about the future. Um, just, Again, we're getting a little sidetracked, but there's one very important point. There was this study that was done recently where they were screening for myeloma using, you know, this new mass spectrometry, which oh, is yes. incredibly sensitive. Yes. And more than so, like, so the majority of people above the age of 80, yes. like they had abnormalities in yes. in the in mass Clonal spectrometry. Mass spec, yeah. So you're going to like you know, in our efforts to cure myeloma, if we start doing this, like you're gonna like medicalize such a large amount of society because most most elderly people are going to have abnormalities and they're going to be medicalized and they're going to be given a diagnosis of something that's going to psychologically change the rest of their lives so it's it's really worrisome and um i understand that it's coming from a good place and we all want to cure myeloma and maybe earlier detection yeah. intervention is the way to go but well i are guess we gonna, are we going to medicalize society they're uh, uh, i mean the process they've got a they've got an army of industry statisticians doing bullshit papers on cure and here's what i think that i've yet to see and if somebody finds it show it to me to be a cure and here i'm willing to say functional cure so okay the definition of cure after a set course of treatment you have a collection of people who have a survival function equal to age sex match controls that's cure easton russell 63 Okay, functional cure. After indefinite treatment, at some point, you have a set of people who have survival function equal to age sex match controls. I'm willing to accept a functional cure. I'll be happy with one. In order for you to do a paper to persuade me there's a fraction that's cured, you need a landmark time. You need to put a time in the sand, two years, one year. And you need to say that of 100 people in my office at two years, what are the rules that define your cohort that achieve cure? If you're allowed to look at a whole Kaplan-Meier curve and retrospectively say, who are the people who happen to have age sex? That's not the same thing because, you know, you're picking the winners. It's a winner's curse. You don't, you know, you didn't get to do that. in. if you get to do that for healthy people, then there'll be a hundred percent survival, you know, because they're healthy, you know? Okay. So right. you have to define your cohort at a period of time with clear rules and say they have equal survival to age sex. And I've never seen a study do that properly. I've seen all these bullshit cell gene studies. By the way, they're never the first, the person who did all the work is always a middle author. It's some big name first author um, who is incapable of doing that kind of analysis and probably incapable of even thinking about the concept because that's why it's flawed and they're not doing it the way so tell me if, so are, is there a paper that they have a clear definition of the cohort and then prove that they have the same age sex survival function uh, not that I'm aware of um, the people who you know as you mentioned there's a lot of look back yes where, look back you know yeah. where people who've been exceptional responders have been, you know, defined as, as having a cure yes. and they've been very various definitions. Is it a PFS of eight years or seven years or 10 years? 
and you know now they're proposing you know our mrd negativity for this amount of time and stuff so but but yeah, yeah but these are self-fulfilling I, prophecies like people who live to 100 live to 100 you know people who you know yeah. it but it doesn't mean that they were cured you know you have to define it in time and of those people see if they're the ones that live to 100 or it's just a bunch of randomness that you're just picking yeah. the tail of an inevitable okay you see what i'm we saying we have a study yeah we yeah. have a study at asco 22 where we sort of like patient preferences but that's not it's not you know based on the scientific definition that you're proposing but just what a cure means to a patient uh, yes. and how important is it being off treatment toxicity of treatment having or not having detectable disease and i think it, it's a, and i'm excited to present those results i'm excited think, to see i think patients look value uh things differently than how we think they value yes. in terms of even like presence of disease they might value that differently than than how we think and uh, mm. and and toxicity is valued much more importantly than than we do even in the definitions of how patients perceive cure um so, so yeah, here's, here's my final I, I look forward to seeing it i really look forward and by the way um Many people would have more detectable disease if the detection assay was a little more sensitive. Uh, okay, True. but okay, but that okay. Here's what I summarize myeloma. This is why I no offense to you. You're a good you're a good man in an unjust war. But here's why I hate. I just hate it. And then like sometimes I read papers like this, I feel queasy. And I talk to Aaron, and you know he feels similarly. And I talk to you, you feel similarly. And and a lot of other fellows, I think you know junior people feel similarly. A lot of people will privately agree. But here's why I just really. Hate. We've come so far. I mean, we must have 1,000, 2,000, maybe even 10,000 randomized control trials in myeloma. Here's what we don't know. One, we don't know when to treat. We don't know whether to treat smoldering. We don't know whether to treat slim crab. If we're perfectly honest, we don't have reliable data. Two, we don't have reliable data on what the optimal induction regimen is. We don't know three versus four. We don't know what three. And if we're really perfectly honest, we may not even know three versus two. Even some of that data has limitations to it. Okay, four, three. We don't know who benefits from transplant. We don't know who to give it in. Um, we don't know how, you know, we don't know really who has a, and by here I mean like, who can I confidently say by doing this, I, I, I know that if I practice this way on average, people live longer, live better. So I don't know when to treat because I don't really know free light chain ratio 100 benefits quality of life and quantity of life. I don't know VRD is better than DRD. Never been tested head to head. I certainly don't know quad is better than VRD. I doubt it would be. I even have some doubts that three is better than two because those studies all had sort of suboptimal post-protocol care, as you know. I don't know who should get transplant in CR1. Uh, I don't know in whom transplant is necessary in CR2 and who could even withhold transplant entirely in the era of novel drugs. Three, okay. Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I, th three, I don't know that anyone has ever been cured of this disease by that conventional definition. It's different, I think, than Hodgkin's lymphoma and DLBCL, where they do have some subgroups with long durable remission. Um, but I don't know if the cure even exists here. Um, four, uh, I don't know what the optimal second line regimen is. Um, th five, I don't know what the optimal third line regimen is. Um, uh, six, I don't know when somebody should be preferentially put on a phase two study or given a salvage agent that has FDA approval. Um, I think uh, maybe that. So, so basically what I'm saying is 10,000 randomized trials and maybe hundred of billion dollars spent in this disease because this disease swallows cash in a way no other disease does. Actually, you know, patient for patient, the amount of cash we infuse into myeloma is much higher because we have bisphosphonates, we have frequent scans, we have PET-CT, you know, we have more drugs in combination of drugs. And what I think is the root of the rot is there is so much money at stake that multiple myeloma is like the defense contracting business. You're selling toilet seats for $50,000. It's full of glut and wasteful spending. And if there's a lot of good people involved, you know, I think that's absolutely true. I don't think anyone's heart is in the wrong place. But if you're born in a cave and you've never seen the sun, you can't even imagine what daylight looks like. And everyone is born in the cave in myeloma. They're trained by people who are born in the cave. They're ignorant. They're incapable of thinking. They say things that they just repeat things they think that, that people tell them that are just total bullshit. That if we waited for OS in a fifth in a pentarefractory setting, it would take longer than response rate. Uh, but except you have to wait for DOR, and that will add more time. And then. Still Statistically, that's just not true, and we proved that in a paper, but okay. So they just repeat things that are wrong because they're in a cave, and the cave is a cave constructed by pharma, and they pet and they blocked all the light, and they're living in this ignorance and darkness. And who suffers? The patients suffer because the patient is getting so many things. And, you know, it's unfair to say, I mean, it is fair, but also unfair. It's fair to say I had a conversation with the best available data I had, and the patient decided to do this nonetheless. That's all we can do at the end of the day. We are just mere right. mortals. We're just soldiers on the battlefield. But 
It's deeply unfair to that human being that I have to decide, do I do three or four drugs? Do I get a bone marrow transplant where there is a risk that I will die? Um, do I take indefinitely um, carcinogenic drugs like Revlimid, a fucking carcinogen, teratogen? Do I take that indefinitely in combination with other drugs that may themselves be carcinogenic or, or have other maladies? Do I live longer? And, and nobody can tell me you live longer, live better as a result. If I have a free life chain ratio of 100, you ask me, Monty, you know, do you want to get treatment? And, and I'm a doc, and you know, I take care, you know, I know a lot about myeloma. I, you know, it's so many people. Okay, you ask me, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I think personally, I would probably wait because I have an intuition from reading many, many papers that early isn't always better and screening is always flawed. You know, I have an intuition, but I don't have data. And if I'm in that position, I feel like you all cheated me. You took $100 billion, you ran 10,000 trials, and you don't even know if I, with a free life generation 125, have a survival or quality of life benefit from being treated. And that to me, and so when I read this thing, I get so pissed off. <laughs> I get so pissed because it's just like, you're, it's all like, I don't know. It's, it sucks. It really, it sucks. And then no one is fixing it. They're just more, you know, I talked to somebody recently. Okay, this is my rant. I talked, sorry about this. I, I talked to somebody recently and this person was like, you know, I, I'm off Twitter. I don't even want to look at it because he's like, all the, onc and this is an oncology person. They're only an onco Twitter, not COVID Twitter, which is, a okay, let's leave that aside. They're just an onco Twitter, which I used to like. But this person was like, Uncle Twitter is just everyone praising other people for being a giant, a giant, a leader, a genius. Yeah, they're leaders and giants, but they never ran a single fucking good study in their whole career. All their studies contribute to the cave because they're unwilling to demand proper scientific, you know, and they all, everyone rationalizes the choices we make, like we all have to compromise, but eventually you compromise so much that you have like nothing to, you know, you're living in a totalitarian government, you're just accepting all the compromises. Okay, so... They're not giants, in my opinion. They are people who don't know history and they've never really pushed because doctors should have a lot more power. Um, so there's that praise. There's praising the young people. There's praising people for ghost authoring papers. I mean, I don't know what to think. It's like if you have a morality, you feel like you feel like you're in a land of sinners. I mean, I don't know. It's depressing. It's depressing. It is. Yeah. It is. You, I, yeah. I mean, I, I I largely agree with a lot of what you've said and. Yeah, we make compromises. And I think the one thing is that, you know, cumulatively, even all these flawed trials, they have made our patients live longer, but our patients could have could live even better with maybe less therapy. And we could identify patients who need more therapy had we designed better trials. That's and, a, and, let me do a, Let me do a thought yeah. experiment for you. Okay. Okay. Um, the world we live now is in the middle. A world where um, we just approve drugs with activity and we give them in whatever way you want. There's not a single trial. You know, I just know Revlimid, 38% response rate, DARA, 42, or, you know, whatever the numbers are, right? I just know the response rates, okay? But I give them whatever way I want. Current world, or my world where you actually have to, like, run sensible randomized trials and target populations. I, I believe that my world will have the best OS and the best quality of life and a lot more certainty. Um, and maybe there'll be fewer drugs like Selenexa and Belen. Some of these drugs would never have even made it. Like Melflufen would never have made it. You know, we would have never had a Melflufen. Okay. I think the world we live in now and the world where there was just no data at all, I'm not really, pers I don't know if they're going to be that dissimilar. Um, is it true? Um, it, it's hard to say. It's, an, it's a very interesting thought experiment. I think cost of therapy would probably be similar. <laughs> In, in the current world and that dystopic world that you imagine um if you so, ban so if you banned pharmaceutical payments to doctors i think i think you would dramatically lower cost and survival would be untouched i think because i think it's that that's like the root rot um so but you agree with the assessment no clear evidence on who to be when to be treated uh, first line second line i mean it's really amazing that it is this way yeah, and I think you know the problems you highlight are, are are all legitimate, and I think the solutions are are complex. And in the current landscape, where all of the funding is done by pharma, where we we're not going to get those answers. Um, and they think they think a complete overhaul of the system where there's better regulatory oversight from the FDA, and there's a lot more funding for clinical trials um, from you know the government. Um, would would go a long way in alleviating some of these ills, and but yeah, so I, I largely agree with a lot of what you've said, and these are things that I struggle with daily. 
and I try to have these conversations with my patients. I the reassure reason... them that overall things are getting better in terms of like how well you can live, but um, but yeah, there are there there are better ways to do things for sure. I actually. I'll push it up. I make you so uncomfortable. I'm sorry about that. Uh, no, no, it's all good. When I was, okay, when I was, I was feeling it, the heat of the moment. You know, I actually even think we're worse than the soldier going to the unjust war and killing unjustly. And I'll tell you why. Because ours is a noble profession that transcends pharmaceutical involvement in cancer. Pharmaceutical involvement in cancer heavily has occurred since 95. Um, our profession goes back thousands of years. Uh, the oath we take is a thousand year old oath. Uh, it's not an oath to improve the market share. Um, so I think, whereas a co countries have lived for you know hundreds of years, you know countries have more longevity than pharmaceutical corruption of medicine. I think. Um, so insofar as there is this appeal to precedent, the next thing is that soldiers swear an oath to do what the commander says, even if it is not right or sound. Um, they have you know very, and that's part of what it means to be soldier. But we're not a, really a soldier. You're a doctor. And the people who go into our field, they're like they're supposed to be the smartest people. I mean, there are a lot of very smart people. And I think that, you know, we all, you know, you can't like, um, like when you watch a movie of like the guy who was the mafia hitman and he killed like 50 people, he, and, and then you watch like, uh, or, 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 or Walter White in Breaking Bad and how he become breaks. And it's just a series of small compromises. And by the end of it, you look in the mirror and you don't even know who you are anymore. You know, you don't know what you stand for. You've compromised who you are. And I mean, I think that's life, but we, but the majority, I mean, not the majority, but maybe, uh, but a lot of us in med in oncology, we, it's compromise. And it pains me when the fellow is already compromising. And it pains me that people like, I don't know, don't even acknowledge that these are the realities that you just don't know when to treat. You don't know how many drugs to give. You don't, you're not doing the right studies. The endpoints are garbage. You're validating garbage endpoints against other garbage endpoints in a daisy okay. chain of garbage. Um, and, and, and who, look who's making the money. Just look what, I mean, it's, we're literally shuffling huge amounts of money. Yes, we're getting some active drugs, but I think that ironically, that's not because of how we're doing the trials. Because for instance, pancreas cancer, they would be happy to shovel money to the companies too. It's biology that's yielding, you know? It's, it's, not, it's not that we're spending the money recklessly because they're happy to spend recklessly too. They just, the biology won't yield. It yields, it yields a little bit more in our disease. That I don't think is because of the money. Um, it's just randomness. It's just that lucky breaks. Um, or okay. maybe the disease itself. So I'm disappointed. Um, you give good context yeah. and balance. But I mean, I think like, what will it take to really reform? One, I think people should read that book, Malignant, over my shoulder. Um, I mean, it, it, it has shaped my, just a plug for your book. I think oh, it's thanks. shaped yeah. a lot of my Pay thoughts and it's shaped a lot of my research interests. And I think it was a very pivotal, defining book um, for, for my career so far. So yes, I highly recommend it. Um, and before yeah. somebody <laughs> says that that's a conflict, I'll tell you, I think I make less than minimum less than like three dollars an hour for writing that book <laughs> i mean i i could do a moonlighting yeah. shift and do better okay um uh it's not a conflict it's uh when you write something that is a philosophical book you know it's uh it is it is your view um but i think that's a start and i think that i don't know we all have to like oppose this system it is really bad um it's a re it's a type of like economic hegemony um it's really huge amounts of capital are moving around. The words evidence and randomized are being thrown around. But what the net result is just massive uncertainty, core questions, patients getting tons of products, very little idea who's benefiting from what. Everyone's patting themselves on the back, creating endpoints that allow us to pat ourselves on the back because they go lower. Um, you know, uh, giving, you know, like you say, like, how does a patient feel about having residual disease? But they only feel it because you told them they have it because you ran exactly. some crazy assay. You didn't need to run. You know, um, if you're feeling good, it, you know, you, you, you know how, you know, I know how, I've never been scanned and I, I, don't, I don't think I've had a blood draw for 25 years and I, I don't want to, you know, until I start feeling bad, I'm not going to go to that uh that doctor they can't make you feel better so any last thoughts on this i mean you know i don't have it i mean kudos to this person who wrote this who i have no idea who it is but um you know i mean i think they do as fair a job as possible they're just i think fundamentally biased towards 
at every juncture where you could choose between more or less or say, you know, as long as we don't know for sure, let's do the prudent cost effective thing. I think they at every such juncture, they go the other way and say at every juncture where you don't know for sure, do the more costly, more intensive way. Um, that's sort of an attitude that's pervasive in the field that I think is misguided um, and runs counter to some evidence. So but, you know, fine for them to write this article, but I disagree totally. The uncertainty is massive. Um, this article will give people, you know, Jansen's going to get a lot more cash because of this article, you know, because, you know, that's how yeah. people practice. Um, and I think our field is really corrupt. And uh, the last thing I'd say, <laughs> um, why do so many people go to pharma? You know, this, uh, I won't say names, but we hear even, you know, another, another group of people going to pharma. And the answer is that being an academic oncologist and being a pharmaceutical employee, it's the same job description, you know, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, it was a different job description. We were committed to knowledge. They were committed to advancing products to save people. But, you know, they were committed to advancing products and we were committed to the sort of the, the pure truth of the world. We didn't have a lot of data. We had the tools at our disposal, but that was the difference. We had a different goal. We were committed to teaching. We were committed to great patient care. Now, teaching nobody cares about because every time you teach a class, it's time that you're not pursuing what it takes to get promoted. Ain't nobody want to promote you for teaching. Uh, nobody wants to promote you for critical scholarship. They, they're hard to, they give you difficulty when they review it. You know, you write a letter to the editor that screws him. They say, oh, you know, there's no space. And then another journal says, we, we don't allow commentaries about just one clinical trial. I was like, come on, you know? So yeah. like, okay, so that's thankless. Um, and, and the job is like running the trials, um, where you're collecting all this cash. And one day people wake up and they say, I go to work early, I see all the patients, I'm on Zoom meetings all day with pharma, and then I see the patients again and go home and I make X amount of money. I can omit the seeing the patients, they'll see the patients for me, do the same Zoom meetings. Uh, the new fellow will be like my NP, seeing the patients in the morning and afternoon and make more money and get stock options. Of course, they're just gonna keep switching. And so if the university wants to retain them, you're never going to retain them because you'll never pay more than pharma and you're never going to have a more flexible schedule. You have to give them a purpose in life that's more meaningful. And, uh, but the university is, misses the boat. All right. I'll give yeah. you the final word. I ranted so much. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry to ambush you with my no, no, angry is, uh, thoughts. I'm, <laughs> angry I'm glad thoughts. To be here. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. So I think overall, yes, things are getting better. I don't envy anybody who has to write an, a review article on how to treat newly diagnosed myeloma. I might have chosen a slightly different approach in some of those topics, but you know, I think some people would attack me, would attack me for my opinions because uh, there's no because as you point out, like we just don't have answer to a lot of these questions. And the sad part is that. Even on the horizon, we are not getting answers to some of these questions because there's little appetite for it, there's little funding for it. The problems are there, as you and I have highlighted, and the solutions are complex, and um, I hope that we make some palpable change. I'd like to think that with our advocacy, um, I think that you know people are listening, and maybe the next generation will be a little different than, than the generation that preceded us. Uh, that's what I'm hopeful for. Um, and... Yeah. So my, my final thought is, you remember when we look back in history, there were people who took the um, cells from Henrietta Lacks without her consent. Mm -hmm. And there are people who took people for like lobotomies against their will. And now we look at those people and we ask like, you know, how could they do that? You know, but they were good soldiers in their time, too. I think they were just well within okay. whatever the ethical rules. And so when they look back at us, <laughs> oh, we're going to get it. We're going to get it bad because they're going to say that, look at these people were publishing. The control arm was wrong. The post-protocol care was wrong. There was no data for early treatment. There's no data to this. You're getting all these payments. You're not, you're the ghost first out there. You come on, dude. You knew it. <laughs> right. All right. All right. On that positive yeah. note, Monty, thank you. You're a consummate gentleman. You know, I'm the one, all, uh, all, ne <laughs> all the negative things were said by me and all the good things were said by Monty. Let the listeners know. Direct your uh, criticism to plenary session podcast at gmail.com. Mani Moyudin, expert myeloma doctor, genuinely good soul, great researcher, productive man, um, maybe, maybe the man who can save our field. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. <laughs>